I'd like to thank everybody for coming today to the 20th anniversary of the, uh, the Institute for International and Cross-Cultural Psychology. Um, so this is the day after International Women's Day, and I'd like to point out, yes, I'd like to point out that for our last presentation today, our panel are all women. Uh, and so it's my pleasure to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Sonia Suche, Professor and Chair of Psychology at Pace University. Dr. Suche directs the Heart, Mind, Spirit, and the Globe Research Institute. Her work emphasizes the mind, body, spirit, and culture connection and the impact of stress on the mental, physical, spiritual health of individuals. Beginning with her early, early studies on anger, her research incorporates effects of chronically stressful circumstances, such as immigration, low socio socioeconomic status, resource poor urban neighborhoods, and globalization, anger, and hostility. Anger leads to emotional, cognitive, physiological reactions, which may be harmful to physical and mental health. An important aspect of anger is that it is harmful to individuals who experience it, as well as the people around them frequently resulting in acts that range from interpersonal anger to violence against individuals and society as a whole. Since anger can harm not just the person experiencing it, experiencing it but also society, most cultures in the world have regulated anger Regulated anger, let me end that properly. Similarly, most spiritual traditions have emphasized on, modeling, on modulating the experience and expression of anger. Dr. Suche's research done in the lab emphasizes all these various dimensions of anger, including how lack of material and non-material resources and inequity, which are part of the immigration and globalization experience, influence the experience and expression of anger that harm that the harm that anger can cause to the person and society, and how culture modulates and buffers its, buffers its impact. Communities studied in the lab include ethnic groups, including Indian, Chinese, and Latinas as they acculturate to the United States. Studies include adolescents, emerging adults, college populations, and community samples. Diverse methodology used in the lab includes experimental studies of stress reactivity, surveys, interviews, and qualitative studies on stress and its psychosocial correlates. Currently, there are studies ongoing on stress and health habits amongst college students and stress experienced by Middle Eastern and Asian immigrant women. International studies in the lab include studies in India, on globalization, spirituality, stress, anger, and health among college students and middle school students. Students are intimately involved in these activities and they are an integral part of all research being conducted. The title of Dr. Suche's talk is Globalization, Spirituality, and the Youth in India. Firstly, let, let me just thank Dr. Uwe Gielen for inviting me and Dr. Hirsch for that very nice introduction. Thank you. Um, so despite all that stuff about anger, that's not what I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, I'm gonna be talking about globalization, spirituality, and the youth in India. India is a young country with almost 65% of its over 1.3 billion people um, below the age of 25. Um, in the recent election, we had almost 150 million 18 to 23 year olds who were part of the voting pool. So studying young people in India is pretty critical and pretty important. In order to understand India and Indian psychology, there is a very powerful movement within the country of psychologists who have tried to establish an Indian psychology post-colonialism to try and understand the people from their own perspective rather than from a westernized perspective of psychology. And they have identified three critical elements that help understand Indian people. One is that the Indian mindset is pluralistic, um, where there is contradictory information 
frequently dealt with at the same time. It's part of the cultural ethos. Spirituality, it's a deeply spiritual country and spirituality is integrated into all aspects of functioning and extremely fast-paced globalization, which is what the country is dealing with right now. The impact of globalization is manifested in people's day-to-day -day lives. It's manifested in thinking, feeling, acting, cultural perspectives on health, on different aspects of living. And what is globalization? Globalization, there are many, many different terms for it. Um, it started out from the field of economics, but for a social scientist, it is so much more than simply the movement of capital and pro products across countries. It is about people, it is about products, and it is about processes, um, which have a significant impact on people. They provide new avenues of growth and opportunity, but they also provide a challenge. India has been interacting with the world since time immemorial through education. There have been many, many um, accounts in remote history as well as more recent history about Indian scholars that have traveled all over the world and scholars from various parts of the world who've come to India. The trade routes, which is, you know, we know the well-known Silk Road, which um, terminates in India. Travel, there are relics in ancient Greece which show interactions with ancient Indian civilization. Spiritual and re religious discourses, which became popular in more recent times through the Beatles. And cuisine, the spices. Everybody knows about India and Indian spices. So youth in an era of globalization, young people are facing unprecedented challenges. And if you categorize those challenges as much as it is possible to categorize them, they fall into two categories. One is the shifting from infectious disease to mortality due to human behavior. Unintentional injury, homicide, war, interpersonal violence, so young people are having to deal with morbidity and mortality due to these factors. And they are having to deal with transitioning into being well-functioning adults in a very, very multi-dimensional world. Um, and spirituality. Spirituality and religion are deeply entwined. Um, they are in India as they are everywhere else. But overall, spirituality is about finding personal meaning, and religion is about the social manifestation of spiritual beliefs. India is multi-religious, many different religions. All of these are religious sites just in Mumbai, probably within a three to four mile radius of each other, sometimes on the same street. So it's a multi-religious country. And the two predominant concepts within Indian spirituality that have been emphasized are the concept of karma, which we've all heard. It's about actions and actions having an impact on your life. Um, it's not just Hinduism, but there are many different religions that have some aspect of karma that are embedded in their teachings. For example, do unto others as you want others to do unto yourself. That really is an underlying concept of karma, which is you do so engage in certain actions and they will have a certain impact. Dharma is a little bit more complicated, but it also, in addition to karma, it includes concepts of duty and responsibility. Um, another part about India which is important to understand is that it's a collectivist society. So social obligations, social norms are a very intricate part of every young person's identity. Indian lifestyles are embedded with these concepts of dharma and karma in all aspects of functioning. And the final idea that I started out with is the dualistic Indian mindset. 
if you look at the data on individualism and collectivism, it is extremely difficult to categorize where India stands on that continuum. On the one hand, it is a collectivist society where family is all important and the engagement of family is critical in all aspects of functioning. Um, on the other hand, um, there is a deeply individualistic philosophy embedded into a person's spiritual journey. Um, there is frequently a statement which embodies that, which says that your final journey or your soul's journey is always an individual journey. It's always alone. So it is a culture that entwines individualism and collectivism very deeply together. And this dualistic mindset has been difficult for people outside India to understand. And one way in which it has been conceptualized within the psychology literature is that it's a, it's, it is defined by a very, very high sensitivity to context. In other words, behavior is modulated by place, time, and person. Um, hence, the internal and the external may not always be consistent with each other because the external is manifested based on time, person, and place. The current study examined lifestyles and beliefs surrounding spirituality globalization amongst young urban Indians in Mumbai. For those of you who are not familiar, Mumbai is um, probably at the forefront of globalization. It is a, um, it's the financial capital of the country and is an extremely westernized city which is still very, very essentially Indian. Um, it's possible to travel to certain parts of Mumbai and not be able to know whether you are um, in some incredibly uh, wealthy paradise somewhere, anywhere in the world, and two minutes later find yourself in the largest slum in Asia. So it's a very heterogeneous city at the forefront of globalization. It truly captures what globalization is and how it is manifesting itself. Um, amongst emerging adults in India, they face the same challenges that emerging adults do everywhere, which is career, marriage, financial independence. And however, there is a qualitative difference because in all of these decisions, there is a strong emphasis on society. You know, where is your social position? How does your family perceive? How does your family feel about these decisions? Which is distinct from emerging adulthood in the West. Um, so in our current study, participants came from St. Xavier's College um, and were about 19 years old. One important thing to point out is that India is approximately 87% Hindu. However, in my sample, um, Hindus were almost 42%, and I had an overrepresentation of Catholics and Christians because it is a Jesuit institution, um, and you know there is a preference given to Catholics and Christians. So this is slightly odd in terms of the sample in India. So we de developed the life belief scales item, which was based on prior research. Previously, one of my students had done her dissertation on health values, health beliefs, health behaviors um, amongst this group. And we had done some qualitative studies to figure out what is it that people believe in? What is it that they do? What kind of things do they value in terms of their own health? Um, we included items on core values and goals within Indian culture on family, culture, uh, karma, and self. And the factor analysis of this life belief scale came up with, five, with six subscales. Um, you can see them right there. The first is materialism. Second is collectivism. Third is religiosity. Fourth is personal agency. Fifth is spirituality and wellness, and the sixth is karma. So we came up with very distinct entities which, you know, kind of, I think,
capture this whole idea of globalization with collectivism, materialism, all of it panning out as being important. Um, when we correlated these, I mean, this is just showing that four of these subscales seem to fall under a more traditional perspective, collectivism, religiosity, spirituality, and karma. And two of them fall under more individualistic perspectives, which is materialism and personal agency. When we correlated these with religious and spiritual well-being, we, then, we also correlated it with interdependent and independent self-construal, which is a scale that measures individual identity and collectivist versus individualist cultures. Um, we also created a new scale where we asked people how much they identify with being Indian. Um, so it is their self-identification with India. And self-rated health was the other scale. What we found is that traditional subscales of the life belief scale were associated with Indian identity and interdependent self-construal. So this is some validation for the scale. And it is also showing us that the essence of Indian identity, despite globalization, despite the fact that this is a young group of people that is very liberal and very much is part of the westernization and globalization conversation, they continue to still identify Indianness with the more traditional values of collectivism, religiosity, spirituality, and the concept of karma. Um, it's important to understand that it, uh, globalization was ushered in India through a very deliberate policy of opening up its doors to the rest of the world in 1991. Um, until that time, India had followed a strict policy of protectionism. However, in 91, because of severe financial crisis in the country, they were forced to open their borders to the rest of the world. Because till then, as a reaction to the British, India had shut its borders down because the British came there to trade and then ended up ruling the country for almost 100 years. Um, so they had shut their, their doors down. What we find is that traditions, particularly when it comes to family, continue to persist. Things like arranged marriages, joint families, as opposed to in, uh, nuclear families, which consist of grandparents, male siblings, their spouses, and their children continue to persist. Traditional family roles for women and spiritual and religious values. So these traditions are resilient because, as I said earlier, India since time immemorial has had its tentacles reaching out to the world through trade, through religious and spiritual discourses, through education, through spices. Um, it's not its first exposure to um, globalization. And Indian traditions have survived first the Mughal invasion, no, pri prior to that, even the Greek and Persian invasions, followed by the Mughal invasion, and then the British. So Indian traditions have continued to survive despite almost three to 500 years of outside invasions attempting to control the country. And similarly, the question becomes, are they now resilient towards the forces of globalization as well? Forces of globalization are typically moderated by structural and institutional realities. Let me just explain that a little bit. Um, the cultural co context of globalization is collectivism and social institutions. So these kind of social institutions and cultural values um, make it harder to simply adopt these globalization values. Um, and I think it'll become even clearer when I talk about structural realities. The economic infrastructure of the country doesn't allow for individuals to live independently. Um, social infrastructure, for example, dating is extremely difficult if you live in the midst of a conservative family structure with lots of relatives around. 
Um, so these factors make it difficult. There are institutional and structural realities that are protecting against globalization, particularly when it comes to cultural and personal values. So in India, emerging adulthood is qualitatively different. There is still in an emphasis on arranged marriages. And what is so critical is that even though Indian young people in India are dealing with the same challenges, finding a career, finding a mate, um, looking towards financial independence, parental preferences are salient in all of these choices. Um, so Indian kids will frequently say that I will not marry somebody who my parents don't approve of, who my family doesn't approve of. Marriage is still between two families, not between two individuals. And we have some conceptualization of health moving towards more non-traditional grounds. Self-rated health is associated with materialism and personal agency. So, you know, feeling like I have control over my own life is a part of my sense of being healthy. So that you're seeing, there is some shifting. It's not like there is no shift. There is some shift. And existential and religious well-being was associated with collectivism and religiosity uh, with our subscales. So what we see is globalization has got the old and the new living together. Just as I said, there are slums and fancy hotels living next to each other, fancy apartment complexes living next to each other. Questions? Sorry, I had to rush through it. But. You have this group of students mm -hmm. who naturally is aware, uh, uh, able to afford to education, right? Then there are other groups of individuals who is not so. Uh, so have you look into those populations in terms of globalization and change of mindset? Um, now, firstly, this group of students doesn't represent a particularly wealthy group of students. It represents a bimodal distribution. Um, because like I said, it's a Jesuit institution and the fees do not determine a person getting in. Um, it's a pretty, um, it's an educational institution with pretty high standards and a pretty good reputation. So it's more the um, ability of the students that gets them in. Um, in terms of looking at globalization amongst a poorer population, we've just completed a study on rural women in India, and absolutely it is a lot less. On the other hand, I don't know if during your trip to India you traveled any of the small villages and towns, but development there is very interesting because um, they've gone, like one year that I went back, everybody, um, there were little um, internet, uh, no, not little internet. They were um, ISD calling booths in every little village where you could call internationally from any tiny village, which was new. A year later, I go there, and suddenly those ISD booths have gone, and internet cafes have shown up. Three years later, when I go, um, you still have the vegetable seller in Mumbai coming and selling vegetables on the street. However, now that vegetable seller has a cell phone in that cart, and you call from upstairs, tell them what vegetables you want, and they get delivered to you. So at, it's, the poorest person is exposed. However, the inequity is very significant. Um, and that inequity, I don't think has anything, globalization has only enhanced it. It always existed in Indian culture. Um, can you comment about the differences you observe between the Christian, Catholic, and Hindu students? Um, actually, the differences were not very significant, which I have to tell you I was a little relieved about because I did not want to get into how I would explain them if I found them. So in this particular sample, they were not that significant. So our Next presenter 
Dr. Rashmi Jaipal is a professor emeritus of psychology at, uh, from Bloomfield College, New Jersey, where she specialized in cross-cultural psychology. Her areas of interest are immigration and acculturation, psychology and sustainable development, cultural conceptions of health and healing, indigenous psychologies, cross-cultural communication, and implicit culture. Dr. Jaipal is the founder and director of the Center for Cultures and Communication at Bloomfield, as well as a diversity internship program and uh, diversity training while you are at the college. You still there? Yeah. Okay. Um, right, Professor Emeritus, yes? Okay. Uh, since January 2013, she has served as an APA non-governmental organization representative at the uh, United Nations. She received her PhD in clinical psychology from the New School for Social, Social Research in New York in 1995 and worked for some years as clinical coordinator in rehabilitation in a rehabilitation program for the homeless, mentally ill on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. For her doctoral dissertation, she looked at cultural differences in moral perspective between India and the United States. And the title of her talk is Social and Psychological Costs of Development for Youth in Sikkim, India. Thank you. I wanted to thank uh, Professor Gielen very much for inviting me to present. Uh, he'd heard that I had done some research in the last two years in, uh, in the Himalayas and Sikkim in India. So um, it's, it's, it's a really uh, nice opportunity for me and a great honor to be able to present here. And also I wanted to say it's been um, very interesting to uh, dialogue with my colleague, Dr. Uh, Sachde. Both of us are doing this um, research in India on globalization and um, they, they sort of complement each other in interesting ways. Uh, there's a, it, there's a, it's a very rich field with many, many interesting um, uh, psychological ramifications uh, for it. So I think Dr. Sajdeh's work shows the very important role traditional culture plays in promoting resilience and um, the ability to uh, deal with all the changes happening. And my research is showing how some of this uh, is having a, a difficult impact on um, more people in rural areas, I think addressing the question you were, you, perhaps some of your questions may all, this may shed some light on it as well, but it's a very complicated and rich field, so, you know, um, during question and answers you can ask more. But so basically I, you know, I've been going to India every year for many years now, and the change is happening, like Dr. Sajde said, I mean, the changes. Uh, through globalization have been so rapid, uh, it's quite astonishing to see. And also, I tend to get upset by the changes. I see because also you can see the growing inequality and the complete lack of planning, urban planning, so that you will get uh, malls and, and all kinds of things uh, built that have nothing to do with people's daily lives and helping them support them. So what this, uh, what, I, what my study is really about is I've been trying to look at what are some of the links between economic globalization that's hitting our country so uh, rapidly now, and um, some of the mental health, the psychological costs or consequences, particularly to youth, uh, which is again, um, you know, something that we've been looking at. So, um, f one thing also I wanted to first look at is what are the global trends in terms of mental health? Um, what are some of the global trends, and are w are we seeing that in India as well? So, according to the World Health Organization. There have been global increases in mental health problems and suicide, particularly youth suicide in recent years. And to me, this is a sign of unsustainable development because this is again, in, uh, at the UN, the, the big issue is what is, how do we create a model for sustainable development? And so far, what I'm seeing is the model for development that is spreading around the world is unsustainable because of the uh, from my point of view, the mental health factors involved. So you see in high-income countries, in the National Center for Health Statistics found the suicide rate in, US, in the U.S. in 2014 had peaked in the la it had It was the highest in 30 years um, uh, and across every age group except older adults. 
and suicide for young adults between the ages of 15 to 29 years is the leading cause of death in both high-income countries and lower and middle-income countries in the Southeast Asia region. You also see, I found it very interesting, there's this massive study that's done annually in the, in the UK, in England, the Good Childhood Report. And in 2016, it found that 10 to 15 year old girls in 2014 were more miserable than they were five years earlier, unhappier with their lives and their appearance, and reporting feeling ugly or worthless. And since then, the 2017 report ha is only more of the same and actually it's getting worse for the, this age group of young girls. And the lower and middle income countries in Southeast Asia have the highest rate of suicide, 17.7, compared to low uh, to high income countries and the global average in 2012, according to the World Health Organization report. And in India, the youth suicide rate for the 15 to 29 year age group was 35.5, whereas the US rate for the same age group was 12.7 in the same year. So what is going on? You know, this is a question that you, I feel like I have to ask, why is this happening? Why are the youth in India particularly and in that region um, uh, so vulnerable to this? So the question, as I said, is why with these rising rates of mental health problems and suicide around the world and in India in particular, economic globalization uh, seems to coincide with this increase. Because developing countries are trying to emulate and rapidly transition to free market consumer economies, the Western model of an advanced society. Pressures to assimilate to this kind of model of development may be contributing to increasing stress levels and mental health problems, including youth suicide around the world, not just in developing, but also in developed countries where youth suicide rates are increasing. So for South Asian uh, countries, the larger the cultural and economic gap between traditional societies and Western-style developed economies, the larger the cultural distance the more stressful the transition, which may be contributing to their higher suicide rates. That was my thinking. And um, before I get into the research, I just wanted to show you how India, what, what development is hap what kind of development is happening in India. It seems to be very une uneven and non-inclusive development. India is churning, I feel. It's like cities are seeing an increase in the development of malls and slums with no adequate infrastructure, water and electricity. And as Dr. Sachde is saying, a huge increase in communications technology in the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, you know, rampant growth in cell phone towers, satellite dish TV, cell phones, internet, social media. Villagers in rural areas have cell phones and satellite dish TVs, but no toilet. Um, they, because, of course, women's needs are not seen as that important anyway. And they don't have basics, water, healthcare, sanitation, but they will have access to the global media. So this is what I wanted to study. And I just wanted to show you some of the uh, images of India right now. You have this traditional figure of, the, uh, of our very sacred monkey god, Hanuman, uh, alongside a, a new <laughs> flyover, uh, uh, alongside traffic and so on as well. And then you have, this is like, again, some of the <laughs> development happening. Then you have these very high-end malls, huge stretches of malls in Delhi, the capital. Uh, and then just next to the mall, you have this slum, this, uh, these slum uh, dwellings, which were r literally, this is just a few feet from the mall. And you see on top, you see a satellite dish on top, if you can see it. I don't know if you can, uh, you may not be able to see it, but uh, there's a satellite, couple of satellite dish, uh, dishes right on top. And then you also see, again, this is another m slum near a very upscale residential area in Delhi, then you have what's called cyber city, again, all of these things. F I have only five minutes, okay. <laughs> so these are some of the things. So I wanted to sh um, say that also in India, there's a tremendous variation in suicide rates between states. So some states have much higher rates than other states. So um, that was also interesting. So I, w I did my study in a, s a state called Sikkim in India, which is in the Himalayas. It's a very, it's the smallest state, and it has a tradition of being very peaceful, Tibetan Buddhist culture, harmonious, very s a lot of social cohesion. And yet now they are, uh, these are some pictures from Sikkim. 
Uh, you can see again Buddhist temples and so on. But yet now you're finding that Sikkim has the second highest or highest rate of suicide in the country, which is again very, very strange. But if you look at development, what's been happening recently is there's been ra very rapid development in Sikkim in the last 10 to 15 years. And so uh, I based the study we did on previous qualitative research that had been done, but I, in the interest of time, I won't go over that. I'll just say that the, that research found, it was a, a large qualitative study, found that the suicides did not seem to be depression related but more like impulsive suicides especially for young people and that the young people seem to have uh, great expectations uh, of, uh, and, and in terms of globalization but somehow their expectations were not being met. So this is some pictures of the urban youth and so what we did is we, I adopted a, an acculturation framework because I uh, saw the globalization and the kind of cultural messages coming coming through globalization as a form of culture. It's not culture free. So consumer culture, celebrity culture, all the kind of uh, Western cultural input coming in is not culture free. And so I s uh, used an acculturation stress framework and I wanted to look at is acculturation stress one of the factors that contributes to mental health uh, problems in Sikkim right now. So the idea was first to find out does acculturation stress exist? And if it does exist, then um, what is it actually correlated with mental health problems? So we found that um, it was a <coughs> pilot study, exploratory correlational study. We had three samples, a college sample in, in the uh, capital city, as well as two, s two high school samples, one in a more rural area, one in, a, and one in the capital city. And th we had eight questionnaires on acculturation stress, family conflict, level of acculturation to Western culture, as well as beliefs about consumer culture, and so on, and then uh, anxiety scales and depression scales. So uh, acculturation stress were questions like, I experience a lot of pressure nowadays to assimilate to an English-speaking Western Western lifestyle. The level of acculturation was how uh, how familiar are you with Western culture, and all conversely, how familiar are you with your own Im, uh, um, uh, indigenous culture? And then beliefs about consumer society. Nowadays, young people believe they are supposed to make a lot of money fast to get ahead, and don't need to work too hard to get it. And another uh, belief nowadays, if you don't have the latest smartphone and gadgets or clothes, people think you're not cool, that, those kinds of questions. And then also questions on how, are you, how much you influenced by the internet. And so we, um, I'll just skip ahead. We had a large sample, 59 college students, 95 uh, high school students in uh, this, the capital and also another um, 90 students in the remote area. So this was uh, the data collection and the results were that we found, first of all, acculturation stress does exist, which, which was interesting because how we measured it was based on those questions and, and we find that not only does it exist but it's moderate to high levels, it's quite pervasive among college students. It was not in that pervasive among the high school students because actually they were relatively sheltered, they had a very strict kind of a schedule and so they didn't couldn't <laughs> access the internet as much as they would have wanted to. We also found uh, anxiety, there were moderate to high levels of anxiety in about 30% of the college students and in the high school students as well, 16 and 13%. Internet influence was pervasive and high across all samples and consumer culture beliefs was also pervasive and high across all uh, samples. So the main results for the correlations was that acculturation stress was, was, we found, significantly related to anxiety for all the samples, college and high school students. It was significantly related to anxiety. So acculturation stress existed, this pressure to assimilate, but it was also, and it was significantly correlated to anxiety and also to the internet influence, not in the college sample, but for the high school students. Um, we also found, uh, number three, that the beliefs about consumer society, those questions I was telling you about, were significantly related to most of the factors. It was the most important factor. The pressure to assimilate to consumer culture was significantly correlated to acculturation stress for all the samples, to family intergenerational intergenerational conflict for all samples and for the in and also to internet influence for the high schools but not the college samples. Um, 
the level, of, what was interesting was the level of acculturation, that is how familiar you are with Western culture, was not uh, that important. What was important was the pressure to assimilate to consumer culture, not the pressure to assimilate to English-speaking Western culture, which I found very interesting. Because in uh, in the past, there, there was pressure to assimilate to, we to uh, English-speaking Western culture was a pressure. Now, it seems that the main pressure is coming from consumer culture pressure. So you can actually buy into Western culture and not experience it as a problem. It, the problem is really consumer culture. And what happened also was age differences. We found that the people most vulnerable to this consumer culture pressure are the young, the kids, the college students by then have also the college sample we um, and uh, looked at was uh, social sciences, critical thinking, sociology students. So they were also uh, in their college classes were being taught about globalization and its negative effects. So they may it may have had less impact on them through the internet. They also probably are much more um, much more able to navigate the internet influence and uh, which one which websites they want to look at. Whereas the children seem to be exposed to a flood of information coming in and they're not able to, they don't know how to handle it. So they're much more, we found, susceptible to acculturation stress uh, from consumer beliefs. Because as age increased, um, uh, the acculturation stress and consumer beliefs uh, decreased. Uh, gender differences were mild but seemed to suggest that women were more vulnerable than men. So um, basically, the main points are that <coughs> Uh, acculturation stress exists that it was related to anxiety and in the sco high school students also to depression. So it's related to m common mental health problems. And um, th internet influence is it's also related to internet influence. And that especially through beliefs of consumer cultures. And that uh, basically um, globalization, uh, to just jump to the conclusion, F it's finding that consumer culture and pressures to assimilate to consumer culture that's coming in through consumer uh, to through communications technology is really does seem to be impacting children's mental health in terms of acculturation stress anxiety and uh, depression um, and that sustainable development um, has mental health as its and health physical health as one of its core goals. So these findings on mental health costs of development seem to indicate that the, the fundamental unsustainability of the current materialistic consumer culture market-driven model of globalization. Uh, and then that's me and my, my colleague. So I'll, I'll <laughs> is it all right? Do I, uh, have I finished on time or do I have? Okay. Thank you. Our next panelist is my colleague here. Dr. Jess Kieran Mathor is a professor of sociology here at St. Francis College with wide ranging experience in gender issues, rehabilitation, development and voluntary work. Besides teaching in various institutions in India and the US, she has worked as a consultant to the World Bank at its mission to the United Nations in New York and she represented UNESCO in the commemoration of the 20th anniversary of the United Nations Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. That's all one big title. She is the New York representative for the New Delhi-based Institute of Social Studies Trust, an NGO with consultative status at the United Nations. In India, she's been part of the Zonal Cultural Center's endeavor to document, preserve, and present the myriad cultural traditions of the country. Um, she's continued her work with women in the US and abroad, first as domestic violence program coordinator and later board member of Saki for South Asian Women. It's a nonprofit organization in New York where she continues to volunteer her time for advocacy and outreach efforts. Dr. Mathor served as the president of the New York State Sociological Association for the year 2007. She's an associate member of the Standing Panel on Social Equity and Governance, formed by the Washington-based National Academy of Public Administration. She was elected to serve a three-year term as a professional member on the board of U.S. National Collegiate Honors Council that numbers more than 1,200 colleges and universities amongst its members. And the title of Dr. Mathur's talk is Revisiting Trauma Through Popular Culture. 
please welcome Dr. Mathur. I think Dr. Gielen has, um, is partial to my part of the world. Uh, he's always encouraged us, and he has a panel which uh, is very, very South Asia uh, focused. Um, I'm um, really glad to be participating um, in uh, such an important event, uh, two anniversary celebrations of um, you know, enterprises and efforts that are very, very meaningful in the world that we live in today. And uh, <clears throat> I uh, have, uh, uh, what I'm sharing with you today is uh, uh, something which is a work in progress, more um, like um, something which I have been thinking about quite seriously, uh, uh, bringing together uh, two things uh, which are one, the very, very successful and prolific uh, visual uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, visual culture which um, is communicated through films, uh, India being uh, a country, yeah, India being a country, can you hear me now? Yeah, India being a country which uh, produces the largest number of films, uh, and we're not talking about necessarily all of them being phenomenally qualitative, but yes, the good, bad, and the ugly, but the largest number of films. And the subcontinent, the Indian subcontinent, having been through um, uh, ex an experience which is uh, quite phenomenal in terms of, again, because one-sixth of the world's population, uh, plus um, one-sixth of the world's population, uh, resides in that part of the world. But uh, an experience about 70 years ago, which uh, is very, uh, which is, sort of in um, the mind of the people, an ambivalent experience because uh, it is really the ecstasy of uh, freedom from colonial rule and the agony of what was the partition of the subcontinent. And um, what um, interests me, it, and there's a concern and a conundrum for me, is that uh, while, um, Multiple efforts have been made to deal with the trauma uh, of partition um, in various cultural forms or genres. Um, somehow this uh, very, very effective and um, uh, popular form of uh, cultural representation, which is film, which includes both television and film representations, uh, has not uh, dealt with this particular trauma um, as, as effectively as it could have, or has not taken it on as subject matter um, as often as uh, one would think um, it would have. Um, we definitely have some representations uh, which exist earlier, but it's only in the seventh decade of India's independence that we see um, a greater representation and more conversations about, uh, about this particular experience, uh, which is, of course, an uh, experience which um, engulfs uh, the minds and hearts of the people in that part of the world and has set the tone for much of what has been happening ever since. Um, we, uh, you know, we may not talk about it overtly, but uh, there has been some representation in all forms of literature, in forms of, uh, you know, music, in forms of um, uh, literature, especially in poetry, the novel, um, you know, short stories, and even um, uh, performances uh, of drama and theater, but it has been more in terms of the individual experience. People have often talked about individual stories and individual experiences, and of course we know that they are in the context of a much larger, almost incomprehensible social fact that existed, and that happened, and uh, um, definitely there were certain parts of the country which were more severely affected, but the whole country seems to be still uh, recoiling from that wound, and um, it does not seem to have been completely healed. That's why um, my, some of my, uh, you know, um, predecessors, earlier speakers have mentioned um, this globalizing India and the modernity which India has been affected by, and we talk so much about um, the economic 
aspect of globalization, and um, I would just want to redefine uh, uh, your definition of globalization and add an element to it that globalization is, of course, a great, you know, very, very a rapid movement of people and goods, but it's also a very rapid movement of ideas across the globe. They're sort of zipping across the globe with, with the modern technology that we have. And much of uh, the second speaker's concerns also um, really are uh, uh, an outcome of that particular phenomena that's taking place. Recognizing a backdrop of what India has already been provided, so I don't need to go into that. Uh, it's a very complex society. It's a multilingual, multi-religious, multicultural society. And uh, everything from the first to the 21st century coexists over there. And uh, there are variations in terms of their urban-rural divides, their linguistic divides, their religious divides. The caste continues to play a big role. Class is an ever-polarizing factor which exists, and these uh, differences have become really, really acute. In the midst of all this, uh, and in what India prides itself on this very more, that it is a sort of, a, a, you know, major um, sort of player in, in, uh, in the world today, and it is fast globalizing, somehow very surreptitiously, um, a very deep kind of uh, uh, non-analytical, but a very stereotypical and biased, prejudiced mindset has also emerged. We notice increasingly in this democratic, diverse country that there is a an increase of what is the majoritism which has come into being. The present political powers that be seem to be uh, propagating majoritism with impunity. And, uh, um, and this very uh, well-equipped and young nation, um, and a nation with a very long history, and of course, nobody ever learns from history, that's another story, but is not being able to, not, it was, sort of was caught unawares, and this nemesis has caught up with it, and uh, doesn't seem to be um, questioning it, or there is, doesn't seem to be enough uh, concern about it. And why I am concerned about, this, like I said, it's a work in progress, I don't have any conclusions as yet, but my concern is that if we have dealt with this very, very effective, if, if we have used this very effective medium, to deal with all other kinds of issues, and very spontaneously and very quickly, because we know the power of this medium, we know how effective it is in terms of communication, we know how effective it is in terms of propaganda, we know it's good for indoctrination. We also know that it is something which is very quick in uh, sending messages and also raising questions. How is it that the partition doesn't get dealt with in terms of and looking you know, sort of a reflective account of the people. We have looked at the independence movement. We have looked at the leaders. We have looked at, um, we, we've done a lot of blame game as well. We have said, oh, so-and-so is responsible. If it wasn't for this decision, this would have happened. Or if uh, it wasn't for so-and-so person, this would have been the direction that things would have taken. We have a lot of nostalgia about the good old times and the way it could have been, etc. However, I suspect, and uh, this is something I'm expressing and but working on, is that I think that what is really, really bothersome and why this medium hasn't taken it up is because if you are talking about the people, not persons or individuals, not communities, but the people of India, and uh, earlier a speaker today brought up a very interesting phrase which Shakespeare has used about um, you know, um, th which comes from Hamlet of, um, you know, uh, the paragon of animals, this human being, the paragon of animals. Uh, I think the very humanity of human beings is in question. And I think that is what is being avoided. That is something which, the even after seven decades, uh, is something which people are not able to face with. It's so, it somehow uh, has been, questions have been asked uh, and uh, you know, uh, decisions have been uh, you know, queried and uh, it has been, um, blames have been sort of leveled, but uh, somehow to recognize that how could this phenomena, which was 
50, the displacement of 15 million people, the largest ever displacement of people in the 20th century. A uh, 100,000 women were sexually exploited and raped and molested in this particular thing. And there were n number of uh, missing and dead. And uh, cities like, uh, I'm talking, of course this happened on two sides of the Indian subcontinent, but if, if you look at the western side of the con subcontinent, the two cities, Lahore and Amritsar, which are now have a border between them, uh, were so completely devastated and destroyed that it took years for them to sort of, you know, come back to some kind of semblance. And these were well evolved cities with, uh, you know, history and culture and, um, and of course, a syncretic uh, sort of ethos, where uh, which was a shared culture. And uh, we often talk about, um, you know, um, the fact that um, there, there's this, out, you know, a, a, a very important part about India is, of course, that every outsider who has come and influenced um, uh, India has also cross pollinated the culture in a way. So that the question Dr. Geelan just brought up the issue about H English or English speaking. I mean, of course, our minds are colonized. People like me dream and think in English. But uh, the fact remains that uh, it is a thing. It, this is part of the history. It's very much part of who we are. This is uh, who we have become. So why is it that this country, which prides itself or this part of the subcontinent, not just India, but both Bangladesh and Pakistan, uh, which have a shared experience and Bangladesh twice over. <laughs> How, why is it that uh, while questions have been asked, why is it that we are still avoiding, um, you know, sh uh, seeing this as something which people and mass could have um, you know, uh, uh, could have behaved in a one particular way or another way, or how is it that en masse people behaved in this particular way? Is it spontaneous? I mean, if it is spontaneous, then it's even more questionable. And uh, I, would, I know that there are vested interests, maybe they would, you know, immediate causes or not immediate causes or whatever it was. But I, I suspect, this is a hypothesis I have, I suspect it is the fear of realizing that this animal is not quite the paragon and it can succumb to circumstances in, in the basest possible way that, uh, that um, is responsible for us resisting uh, the expression of this experience in the most explicit or, and the most accessible of all uh, manners, which would be through film. So you notice that very early on in 1960s, there have been some films which were made, but again, they were individual stories and the uh, it was assumed that it happened in this context, but the en masse behavior of people uh, has not been subsided. I mean, I think Germany has done some uh, a good job in trying to reflect on their history and what has happened, and we know Adorno's work, and we know Milgram's work, and we know that these things have been questioned. But um, I don't think India has done done that job, and I think the fact that it. Uh, the, f the film or the visual medium which can sort of show a mirror to people very, very directly has not been utilized in terms of dealing with this phenomena is also responsible that the phenomena hasn't, we haven't quite expunged the phenomena from our lives. And it is, pos it is because of that that we have been taken unawares by the resurgence of these very, very divisive, um, you know, uh, movements that have come into place. And uh, we haven't been able to deal with this phenomena. So it, it surprises me that uh, this hasn't been done. Though, you know, recent very traumatic events like uh, terrible, um, you know, uh, the wars that have taken place between the countries of the subcontinent have been dealt with by fil in, in films. Murders, molestations, rapes have been dealt with uh, quite quickly after the event has happened and traumatized the nation. But this sort of pan-Indian experience uh, has not been dealt with from a perspective where one would question the very humanity of human beings and, uh, you know, try and figure out how could this have happened. Uh, we do, we do put lay the uh, blame or uh, sort of uh, the responsibility at the door of leaders, ideologies, politics, but we have not said, okay, so what about the common man? I mean, what, how is this happening? And I think that, um, it's very interesting to note that this hasn't quite 
um, been pursued. There is most more recently um, a partition museum. All, all this is, by the way, happening after this, after seven decades. More recently, a partition museum, which has been set up, which is collecting anecdotal evidence and collecting the stories of people before that generation becomes extinct. Uh, so, and perhaps that will be used. So, the progressive writers worked a lot in this. They were futuristic. They thought about these things. The progressive writers movement, Indian people's theatre movement, it turned into, and there was expression in theatre. And some of those writers and um, theatre artists also try to bring this into film. But um, I, I'm quite a film buff and I have been watching uh, films which are very, very successful in India and uh, television dramas which are very successful way ahead of Indian efforts in Pakistan. And I see uh, that it's only in the seventh decade of independence that we see a more frank um, analysis or expression or um, you know, encounter with this experience uh, which is, remains unresolved according to me and I think that this medium could help uh, deal with that experience, come to terms with that experience. Thank you for your attention. Our final presenter today, another colleague here at St. Francis College is Ghazala Osfal. Um, she obtained her master's and uh, master's of philosophy in English literature and language at the University of Peshawar, Pakistan. After teaching at Nisar Shaheed College in Pakistan, she taught at the Department of English at the University of Peshawar for eight years. She received a master's in writing and composition studies from LIU Brooklyn and taught composition and literature for many years as an adjunct professor at LIU. She also taught as adjunct fac faculty at the State University of New York's Harry Van Arsdale Center for Labor Studies. She's worked at St. Francis College since the year 2000 uh, as a tutor, a full-time ESL and remediation coordinator, and as an adjunct faculty member in the English department. Um, and the title of her talk is Afghan Women, Trails, Travise, and Creative Expression. So thank you. Dr. Geelan and uh, Dr. Hirsch. Uh, Dr. Hirsch for the introduction, Dr. Geelan for inviting me uh, to present at this event. Um, so happy to be here. My presentation is uh, mostly anecdotal, more or less ethnographic, based on my own observation. It's not a research paper. Uh, because I'm not that actively involved in uh, research anymore. So my own observations, my own experience, and my own knowledge of the native Afghan Pakistan history is what this presentation is based upon. And while you patiently hear me, uh, there are some slides here for your delight. This is Afghanistan forever since before invasions and perhaps still today. So the story is this, my narrative is this. I was studying for my first masters at the University of Peshawar in Pakistan when the armies of the former Soviet Union started moving into Afghanistan. Peshawar University was then located in the outskirts of Peshawar to the east, literally less than 30 miles from the Turkham border that separates Pakistan from Afghanistan. And Dr. Gillen has been to both all those areas twice, three times maybe, so he's familiar with that. Maybe he can add to what I'm telling you later on because he was there during the Afghan war also. In my childhood, we had frequently tra traveled to Torham for picnics. Even in second grade, I remember going to Torham border for a picnic. Uh, on occasions, we used to go to shop at the foreign goods market at Lundi Kotal, uh, which is barely five miles from the border. Peshawarites used to travel to Afghanistan for their summer vacations and to attend the annual Jashne Kabul the famous Afghan festival 
on 19th of August at which the best artists of South Asia, the entire South Asia, were invited to perform. And the festival is still held today. With interruptions, it's still held today. My family was actually in Afghanistan in July 1977 for summer vacations when the last king of Afghanistan, Zahir Shah, was overthrown uh, by his first cousin and brother-in-law, Sardar Daoud. This is Kabul before it was totally destroyed. The next five years of Sardar Daoud's presidency, and that was the only uh, democratic period in the history of that country, truly democratic period, although the president was not elected democratically, they were rather peaceful. The five years between 1973 and 1978, um, and it seemed at that time like I was in college at that time, so it seemed like Afghanistan was now on a totally new path of progress and enlightenment. But those hopes were dealt a terrible blow when Sardar Daoud uh, was overthrown. Um, Nur Muhammad Tarakai, leading Swar Revolution, assassinated the president and almost entire family, establishing the first semi-socialist government in Afghanistan. This uh, revolution, Swar revolution in 1978, March of 1978, was the beginning of the chaos, the turmoil that has lasted in the last four decades with various stakeholders at different times. The rivalries and the, pol the politics continue on the national scene, but the life as it was lived in Afghanistan until then started changing at that point in dramatic ways. And that is what I will talk about. I wish to briefly mention the ethnic and religious makeup of Afghanis at this point, their religious affiliations, because they play a key role in the situation that that country is in. Major groups in Afghanistan are the Pashtuns. I'm myself a Pashtun. The Tajiks, the Hazaras, and the Uzbeks, which have very close ties, blood ties, geographical ties with the states in uh, Central Asian states, with the Central Asian states. Major and official languages in that country, there are many, but official languages are Pashto and Dari, which is a dialect of Farsi. And these languages, since we were talking about languages earlier also, uh, they are big dividers. Uh, although majority of people, a good number of people, speak both uh, languages fluently. 99% of Afghanis are Muslims, with 87% being Sunnis and 12% being Shias. Again, you hear that conversation, Iranians are majority Shia states, Saudi Arab is Sunni, the extremist Sunni faction. And these figures that I presented, they come from Asia Foundation in a study done in 2012. Another big cause of strife is this religious divide. Interestingly, I found out that from 2016 figures that the re and Shia school of thought are gaining uh, more ground in Afghanistan. That's very strange. I myself was baffled. This background was necessary because that helps understand what reasons beside the Soviet invasion were responsible for the biggest movement of refugees in modern times. More than six million Afghans escaped war and the onslaught of the red infidels. Red infidels were the communists. Um, I must also point out that this is a region that Alexander of Macedonia, Alexander the Great, sometimes called, had steered clear of during his campaigns. He took the Persian Empire. Some of his troops went into what is Pakistan today, but they largely steer cleared of Afghanistan because his general had heard stories, some accounts say his generals had heard stories of these wildly independent and fearsome people. 
Later, the Afghans defeated the British three times in the 18th and 19th century. The last Afghan war against the British was fought in 1930s and the British were defeated in all these wars. Actually, the Jashne Khaber, the Jashne Kabul, sorry, on 19th August is a celebration of those defeats. The Soviet armies could last there only 10 years. And the resultant battered economy of the Soviet Union forced Gorbachev to withdraw his armies after 10 years of his initial invasion. However, it left behind a dismantled and instable system of governance that changed hands between Mujahideen and Taliban. The same fierce nature which had once protected them, human nature as well as physical nature, which had once protected them against foreigners, which now includes Americans also, that fierce nature has not allowed them to unite and find a peaceful, reasonable way of governing their country. While this infighting and uncertainty and the daily suicide bombing continues in Afghanistan. Every day you hear something out of Kabul um, or Afghanistan. The masses still make up the second largest group of refugees around the world. They were the biggest group before Syria started disintegrating. Now Syrians are the largest group and the Afghans make up a quarter of all refugees. Um, Majority of these refugees live in Pakistan and Iran. And if you look at the map, these are tiny countries which can barely support their own population. Most of the Shias, Hazaras, and Sunni Tajiks sought refuge in Iran because they spoke Dari, which is a dialect of Farsi. As I mentioned earlier, majority of the refugees who were Sunni, mostly Pashtuns, they crossed the borders into Pakistan. Both Peshawar and Koita, the border cities, Peshawar is only 34 miles from the Afghan border. They were natural point of entries for these people. That is how, as a Peshawarite, I got an opportunity to closely interact and observe the incoming masses and hear their terrible stories. Majority of the refugees sought shelter in Pukhtunkhwa and Balochistan, the bordering provinces, what happened was that able-bodied men and boys as young as 12 left their families in the tents, in the cities around Peshawar, or wherever they could find a vacant plot of land, and they returned to fight the war in their homeland. In those initial days, women and children were left with little to no money to fend for themselves. Later on, international aid agencies and donor groups started stepping in to help them. But how do you help a family or a people that hope to go back to their own villages and towns with no light at the end of the tunnel? They hope to go back. They went back sometimes, but they had to return because the fighting continued. For 40 years, this has been, this back and forth has been going on. Fresh fighting breaks out, and then men bring back their families right away, no matter how unhappy Pakistan is. And meanwhile, in the war theater, the actors keep changing. So from Soviet, it's the Americans now. Meanwhile, the women and children left behind at the mercy of their unpredictable hosts and the charity of mercurial donor agencies, they are also sometimes there, sometimes not, they suffered endless misery, not really of their own making. Their trauma comes from multiple sources. I'll just mention it, I'm not a psychologist, so I can't comment a lot about it. I would let you think about it. So what are the natures of their traumas? First of all, war, the displacement, death, disease, and rapes, which not only happened at the, hand, uh, uh, at the hands of enemies, but at the hand of their own people also. 
uh, financial instability. Loss of the traditional breadwinners forced women of very respectable families to turn to prostitution. And that was not the worst. They sometimes took out their 10-year-old daughters, 12-year-old daughters, selling them on the streets of Peshawar. I heard those heartbreaking stories also from our driver. The loss of limbs in landmines, I would recommend a movie called Kandahar if anybody is interested, forced once dignified people to beg on the streets. It was said about Pushtuns that they would do the meanest job, but they would never beg. The war brought them down to their knees, took their pride away, and they started begging on the streets of unfamiliar cities. The jihad imposed upon them by cruel and selfish puppeteers, which also included Pakistanis, and absence of a reliable treatment system have prolonged their suffering. The tragedies are countless. The tragedies are just too many. The Afghans and by extension, the Pakistanis, particularly Peshawarite and Baloches, and Baloch also, I'm deliberately not bringing them into this discussion or the child soldiers of Afghanistan, but it has affected them and us in multiple ways. The, the impact on Afghan women is still being measured. Study, studies are being carried out, but it will take some time to find, to arrive at some kind of results. I wanted to identify some of the ways with which women had dealt with the ensuing traumas in absence of doctors, psychologists, and counselors, particularly in Afghanistan. Some facilities may be available in big cities like Kabul, Kandahar, Kanduz, Herat, or on this side of the border, uh, in Peshawar, in uh, Quetta, in Rawalpindi, even historically, they used to come to Pakistan for their treatments. Um, but the women generally don't have access to these facilities, or they can't afford it, or they feel these services are unnecessary. When they have traditional ways of healing from both physical and emotional wounds. There was a lot of talk of spirituality, so I just wanted to add to that. Unscientific though these may be, but most of the time they have turned to century, centuries old customs of remembering, of addressing and documenting their pain quietly in embroidery, recorded eloquently in oral histories and national and personal narratives, or sing fiercely and defiant, defiantly in songs and poetry. I still have <laughs> material, so I don't know. I'll continue with the slideshow. I have, um, I printed a few set of poems, uh, which are written by contemporary um, uh, poets and a very famous Afghan uh, poet named Mina, who was killed later on. Uh, traditionally, this society, Pushtuns, my people, they frown upon poets and artists. They love music, they hate the musician and the singer. Uh, so they would not want your, water, your daughter to marry a singer. But they love music, they adore music, and they love to dance. That's a contradiction. So their daughter, out of the question. I remember my own father's advice to me, write stories. I'm a published author in Pakistan. I've written a lot for television. My father was very proud of that. But I remember once telling me, he told me, don't ever write poetry. But poetry captures the essence of your pain. I couldn't say anything to my father, but here it is, and I continued publishing myself without his knowledge. He never read any of my works. So I'll just show you some pictures. Uh, some slides, and then it's over to Dr. Uh, Gilanen. So this is a woman who settled her score with the killers of her sons. Afghan women are as fierce and believe in revenge just like men. And they are trained in, in these weapons. However, they are very respectful of their weapons. I'll tell you, it's not like, it is called the Wild Wild West, but they respect their weapons a lot, and they don't 
pull it out at the top of a hat. These are uh, three brothers who died um, when Taliban attacked there. This is a mother. The graveyards have moved into cities now. And sewing machines supporting many. That was another way of addressing their trauma. They used to stitch for only their families. Now it has become a profession, especially for women. Traditionally, they did not have female tailors in their cities. Stitch by stitch, their dreams. So they learned. There are some things which are common between different cultures. You'll find these things, beaded work, over here also produced by different other ethnicities. This is typical Afghani creation. I have a beautiful uh, outfit like this, which I've never worn. Um, takes a lot of cloth, a lot of hard work, sometimes six months of work to produce these things. Defying all cultural norms. Traditionally, women do not join the funeral procession. This was a girl who was stoned to death a couple of years ago, accused of uh, having illicit relations with someone. And women stepped up. They told men to step back. They will lift the funeral, the coffin, and they will bury her. And that's what they did. And that's, you know, in their burqas, resistance through protest. Resistance through vote. Everybody goes to the election. And everybody has a voice. Getting there. These are schools in a camp. They're learning how to use computers. That's a heavyweight uh, athlete, the training for weightlifting. That's, an, that's a female athlete. This uh, movie, which was nominated for Oscars, uh, Letter to the President, this is Roya Sadat, one of the movie makers. This is a scene from the film. And they have started a unit of women in their International Women's Day. All power to these women. And this is a cover of the Times magazine, How Not to Lose in Afghanistan. It's still a conundrum. It's still an unanswered question. So that's it. This wraps up uh, the formal presentations for today.